Welcome to Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital's Health Talk. I am Dr. Douglas Shashinsky of Robert Wood Johnson Physician Enterprises Warren Internal Medicine. Heart disease is the number one killer of men and women in the United States. On today's show, we're going to talk about two common types of heart disease. One, congestive heart failure, and the second, atrial fibrillation. One in five Americans will develop heart failure. Atrial fibrillation is the most common cardiac arrhythmia, affecting 2.7 million people with 170,000 new cases diagnosed each year. To learn more about these diseases, we are pleased to be joined by our special guests, Dr. Robert Panabianco, an interventional and invasive cardiologist with Robert Wood Johnson Physicians Enterprise, and Dr. Shubashni Kawada, an electrophysiologist with Robert Wood Johnson Physicians Enterprise. Both are attending physicians at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. Thank you both for joining us here today. Thank you for inviting us. First, let me let's find out a little bit about each one of you. First, Dr. Panabianco, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, et cetera. I'm an interventional cardiologist. I've uh, trained in New York City at Lenox Hill in the 1990s as an interventionalist. Um, I also did a critical care fellowship in Brooklyn at the Brooklyn VA, Kings County, Downstate, State University of New York. I came to New Jersey in 1996. I joined a multi-specialty practice. I've been a physician at Robert Wood Johnson since then. Um, I care for patients in general cardiology, interventional cardiology. Um, I also do a clinic at the Veterans Home in Edison, New Jersey, caring for our veterans. I'm honored to do that. I do clinic once a month. And uh, I am a permanent member of the New Jersey Society. Thank you. And Dr. Shubashni? Pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. I'm an electrophysiologist at Robert Wood. Started in 1995. I did my training at Temple University for General Cardiology. Uh, Philadelphia and uh, my electrophysiology at St. Luke's Roosevelt, which is a branch of Columbia University in New York. Um, started practice with New Brunswick Cardiology um, with an esteemed group of cardiologists as the first electrophysiologist in their group in 1995. And I've been, I'm sorry, 2005, I took yours off, mm -hmm. Rob. Uh, 2005, and I've been here since then. It's been, it's the 11th year since then. I've taken a lot of pride and passion in um, educating and spreading awareness about arrhythmias or abnormal heart rhythms, and also had a passion for speaking, creating awareness on women and heart disease. Um, I've been one of the pioneers in starting ablations in 2005 of for atrial fibrillation. Well, let's let's and talk. Since before, doing that. Let's just interrupt for a second, just so people know. First, what is an electrophysiologist? Very good question. I, I tell something uh, for my patients. Your heart is like your house. It's got two rooms upstairs and two rooms downstairs, and it's got plumbing and electricity. Dr. Penabianco is the expert for plumbing, uh, where your pipes and your house supply water to your house, whereas the pipes of the heart supply blood to the heart muscle itself. And there's also electricity necessary to make the heart function as a pump. And when the electricity is not wired right, or you have extra electrical connections or automaticity that develops in other places of the heart that are not natural pacemakers, you have abnormal heart rhythms. The study treatment um, of these abnormal electrical rhythms of the heart became a branch in itself called electrophysiology. Uh, it's one of the newest branches of cardiology, uh, but grew very steeply. Uh, and profoundly in the last 25 years. Okay, so we'll start with the uh, plumbing. Dr. Panabianco, tell us a little bit about what you do with congestive heart failure. What is congestive heart failure? Now, we know congestive heart failure itself is really not the diagnosis itself, it's the symptom. Tell us a little bit about it. Uh, patients present with congestive heart failure in different ways. Congestive heart failure is uh, a disease of the pump function of the heart. Either the heart is stiff or the heart is flabby and not pumping efficiently. So you need the heart to pump like a motor to the rest of your body, providing blood flow, uh, nutrition, etc. When this pump is not working efficiently, there's back pressure to your lungs, back pressure to your circulation, uh, people get swollen ankles, they get abdominal distension, their liver gets swollen, they're short of breath because there's fluid in their lungs. 
So there's an issue of the heart pump not working efficiently. There are different reasons for this. Uh, the most common reason is coronary disease. In other words, the arteries that supply nutrition to the muscle of the heart are blocked. Patients have heart attacks, they get damage to their heart muscle, the pump function is not efficient, it's compromised, and this creates back pressure to heart, lungs, uh, and the body. A lot of times patients present with shortness of breath, usually it presents initially with exertion, eventually it may occur at rest. Uh, some patients don't present with uh, swelling in their ankles, they have abdominal distension. Those patients are somewhat more challenging because everybody's looking for swollen ankles for heart failure. Um, other causes of heart failure, not just artery disease, includes valve disease. A couple of generations ago, we had rheumatic fever, which was endemic in the different parts of the world, and we had valve disease related to mitral valves. In this day and age, we have senescent valves. So the aortic valve gets narrowed. That's the valve where most of the blood comes out of the heart to supply the body. When it gets narrowed, it's called aortic stenosis. This itself creates back pressure and problems of heart failure. We have leaky valves. Similar, the aortic valve can be leaky, the mitral valve can be leaky or narrowed. Similar issues occur. Um, so the most prevalent issues for heart failure are related to coronary disease or valve disease. The issue of the heart being stiff is another field in heart failure where over time the heart is in, unable to relax efficiently and its ability to pump blood forward is compromised. Okay, so uh, it's a whole gambit of, uh, of reasons for it. Again, someone comes to my office, they're in congestive heart failure. I see en enlargement of the, uh, uh, of the veins in the neck. They may have some flow, they may have some uh, uh, fluid in their lungs. So that patient I send over to you. What do you do? What is your steps to figure out what's causing it? Well, the initial simple steps are an electrocardiogram to look at the electrical rhythm. Uh, because there are also electrical reasons for heart failure, similar in Dr. Gowda's uh, field, if they present with a very rapid rate, the heart can't fill and relax efficiently, so that's the initial evaluation. The physical exam, of course, is uh, pivotal in the issue, and also the history. Uh, a lot of times the history is very important because we can get a sense of, is this related to dietary noncompliance? Are you taking your medications? Do you have high blood pressure? Are you diabetic? Um, have you been having the wrong foods all week and loaded up with salt and then loaded up with fluid? Um, we want to make sure they haven't had a silent heart attack in the past. Right. So the first thing we want to do is make sure it's not acute MRI. Absolutely. So, so the EKG is pivotal in that. The history is pivotal in that. If we don't think they've had an acute MI, we can actually treat them in the office with a diuretic, which is a medicine to make them urinate extra. Uh, we then do some diagnostic testing, a sonogram of the heart called an echocardiogram to assess the pump function, the heart valves, the efficiency of function. Eventually we would consider a stress test to evaluate the patient for blocked arteries or coronary artery disease. Um, and those are the uh, things that we do. We do blood testing as well. It's very important to know, is the patient diabetic? Is their cholesterol very high? What led to this disease process that we can slow down its progression or perhaps improve on that disease? And improving means if you have significant blocked arteries, we could potentially go into your heart from arteries of your wrist, your arm, your groin, up into the circulation of the heart and see if there are blocked vessels. If there are significantly blocked vessels, we decide, is the patient going to benefit with a balloon or a stent? A stent is a mesh that we put inside the vessel to scaffold it open, or some people need open heart surgery because the disease is diffuse, or some people may even need valve surgery because the valves are contributing to the heart failure issues. So there's a whole uh, consortium of tests we need to do. Um, we work closely with the patient and it's very important to educate the patient on their disease processes, what led them to this disease, treating their diabetes aggressively, making sure their blood pressure is controlled, counseling them extensively on diet. I find a lot of times that my patients come to me and we say, you need to be on a low salt diet. They only interpret that as, I don't add salt to my food. And then I have to go through this whole gamut of, well, you buy processed food, this processed food has salt in it, you don't realize it's already added there as a preservative, and we have to go back to the traditional, from a generation or two ago, fresh food, fresh cooked, put your own spices in, don't have processed food. Okay, so we've got the person who's, again, they came to me, they, I can see that they're in congestive heart failure. They
They may have had a history of high blood pressure. They may have had a history of diabetes. First thing we're going to do is make sure they haven't had an acute heart attack yes. because that's something that needs to be taken care of immediately. Correct. If they haven't, now we can run through the whole gambit of tests of what to do since this is a chronic type of disease to work on those chronic issues to improve them, thus reduce their history, thus reduce their symptoms of congestive heart failure. Correct. And I would be sending them again to you to, to get the echocardiogram of the heart so we can look at the movement of the heart, the uh, uh, wall motion. We can look at the thickness of the wall. We can also work if they're a diabetic with a nutritionist dietitian and have them, in fact, even go over to Somerset Diabetes Center and get a very good education on how to treat and how to uh, keep their uh, diabetes under as good control as possible. If they're high blood pressure, again, we want to keep them on the low salt, low fat diet. Uh, we want to have them uh, take their medications. We want to make sure they are taking their medications because unfortunately in this world uh, with medications, most people maybe take 50% of their medications. Then if those all fail, then we go the next steps, which may be doing a cardiac catheterization, looking at the blood vessels, looking at the valves, and then if necessary, either fixing the valves and or fix the uh, blood vessels with either doing a bypass, stent, ablate, or anything like that. Correct. Um, our goal is to prevent recurrence of the disease, optimize this treatment, educate the patient, and assess their risk for a bad outcome within the next six months to a year, and that's why we end up eventually having to define the anatomy. Anatomy defined by uh, sonography, which is the echo, and at times anatomy defined by cardiac catheterization to look at, as Dr. Gaddis says, the plumbing of the arteries as well as the valves. Advances in uh, treatment of uh, congestive heart failure. I, I think the advances have occurred in the, in the medical treatment of heart failure. I think that also as a society the paradigm has to shift to responsibility on the part of internal medicine, family practice, education of the patient. The patient has to partner with us in their treatment goals, their compliance as you say, taking their medicines, compliant with diet. Um, also the paradigm has shifted from hospital treatment to community services. Uh, we have visiting nurses which are excellent from Robert Wood Johnson. We have initiatives for um, patients who are admitted for heart failure to the hospital to help them transition back to the community, educate them with nutrition, follow them on a daily basis with their weights, their oxygenation, their blood pressures, uh, have someone come into the home and evaluate their dietary practices, uh, make sure they have an appointment with their physician within a week of discharge to avoid the recurrence of admission. Uh, the government is very keen on improving the quality and they have certain rewards and um, uh, other issues that they don't really want to see patients readmitted for heart failure. They want us to take the initiative, society, the hospital, the physician, uh, to move the agenda forward. Uh, there are millions of admissions to the hospital for congestive heart failure. We need to convert that process from hospital to community and those are some of the advances that are going to be in a behavior change of how we practice uh, medicine. Um, Heart failure is not just bypass and valve surgery. We have patients who need transplant. Robert Wood Johnson has a transplant center. So there are patients whose hearts are not functioning well enough to be treated just medically or well enough to have open heart surgery. They actually need to move forward to the next step, artificial heart, heart transplant, left uh, ventricular assist devices. These are devices which are mechanical devices, helps the heart pump efficiently throughout the body, um, to avoid the heart failure. There are patients who are in extremis who end up in hospitals on life support and respirators. Uh, the advances have occurred in the last several years with the technology, the ability to improve on the technology, the artificial hearts, the uh, heart assist devices. People can actually go home with a mechanical heart uh, carrying an attache case type of device that works as a, a pump and a generator for that process. So there's a whole spectrum of how we can treat congestive heart failure. And as the population ages, we find that it becomes more prevalent um, and, and we need to just move forward with treating earlier on diabetes, hypertension, and we partner with family practice internal medicine to make sure these patients are 
adequately treated to avoid the endpoint of significant disease that leads to heart failure. So those are the things that are very important for society to understand. So what we're, we're basically talking about is the engagement of the patient along with the physicians, along with the community, in order to reduce all of the uh, possible risk factors for the uh, patients going into uh, congestive heart failure. And if they do go into congestive heart failure and hospitalized to avoid them recurring uh, congestive heart failure, avoid them going back into the hospital because each time they go in, it's just another complication on top of it. So it's starting from the beginning, keeping ourselves as healthy as possible, Absolutely. reducing the salt in our diet, eating better uh, foods, white uh, meats, uh, lots of fruits and vegetables and fiber, reducing our risk of diabetes, reducing our risk of high blood pressure, reducing our cholesterol numbers. And if the doctor says you need to be on a cholesterol medication, you really should be taking that cholesterol yes, medication. Yes, absolutely. And you should be stop smoking. And you should be <laughs> stopping the, uh, you should be not stopping the medication because you don't like the medication. Right. And more importantly, as you said, stop smoking because the cigarettes also increase the risk of all of the uh, complications also. Yes, and, and, and in essence, if you really want to summarize it, uh, the patients who present younger in their 40s with high blood pressure or diabetes, what they need is a lifestyle change. They need a lifestyle change not only in their diet, but their physical activity, their exercise. They need to Behavioral not... Behavioral modifications, Absolutely. As you they need to look at their world and not say, I'm going to start a diet, because start, diets start and end. Lifestyle changes should be started and should be permanent. And, and that's where the impact is going to occur, not at the end of life issues with heart failure and its extremis, but if in the early parts of the disease process, the diseases that end up causing coronary disease and causing heart failure are the diabetes, are the smoking, are the hypertension not treated. So those are the, those are the uh, opportunities that our society needs to embrace and change the direction of the disease process. And it is, as you said, a lifestyle change. It's not one pill to lose the weight. It's not Absolutely. one pill to do that. It's a whole change in our what we do. We have to get off our computers and actually go out and jog a little bit and get onto the treadmill. And we have to say to ourselves that we can't smoke. And even though it's hard to give it up, we got to stop it. And if we do stop all of that, hopefully reduce our risk of uh, congestive heart failure and all of the causes of congestive heart failure. Correct, because congestive heart failure is more the end point of all these diseases in a cumulative way that brings us to uh, uh, an extreme situation. Now let's talk about the electrical system. Sure. Like Dr. Panabianco elaborated, um, the primary uh, goal for heart disease, heart disease prevention. We, um, we, you already have heard all the details about how it can impact end of life situations. And most importantly is the cost. Healthcare cost in 2001 by cardiovascular disease deaths alone was about 520 billion. And the latest um, uh, article in American Heart, uh, February 23rd circulation, uh, has a slide by Danish Marosian which shows uh, the cost to be 520 billion in 2011, which could be about 600 uh, billion in 2015. Um, so the cost is rising from heart failure admissions, coronary heart disease, and atrial fibrillation, I think, which are the leading of all these things. Coronary heart disease being um, the number one killer for sudden cardiac death. Now, coming to atrial fibrillation, it's very intertwined with congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure can lead to atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation can lead to congestive heart failure. They're sort of a uh, vicious cycle. Now, as a brief introduction to atrial fibrillation, I would like to very briefly point to this heart model. These are the two bottom chambers, which are the pumps of the heart, whereas the top chambers are the atrium, which get the blood from elsewhere in the body, pump it over here, pump it to the lung, purify it, and then the to left top chamber or the left atrium is considered to be one of the main triggers for atrial fibrillation. Normal heart acts as a pump. It's a, it's a mechanical pump, like Dr. Panabianco said, and it pumps the blood to the brain and your rest of your body, aorta being the main pipe that pumps it out. In atrial fibrillation, what happens, the one pacemaker of the heart that makes the heart pump 60 times or 70 times or 40 times if you're athletic, 
that's taken over because there's a lot of tissues in the left upper chamber of the heart that develop automaticity. And what happens is they start saying, I'm the master, I'm the master. They, it's, it's basically trying to be uh, survival of the fittest. And they all go in competition to each other. And they're competing to take over the heart muscle fibers and how many times they pump. Instead of having one pump, then your heart is doing this. It's doing an uncoordinated squiggle or a squirm, which is not an effective pump. And that leads to having multiple different um, consequences, whether it's the heart not pumping well, the pump not acting as instead of pumping 65% of your blood to the brain and the rest of your body, it may pump 20, 30, even 45, or even if it pumps 50% of your blood, it may not be doing it in a coordinated, synchronous fashion, which leads to heart failure. It leads to palpitations or fast beating of the heart. Eventually, what happens is patients develop palpitations, heart failure, a lot of uncertainty, anxiety. In 20, 30 decades ago, people used to be diagnosed with panic attacks or anxiety attacks and be discharged from emergency rooms because we didn't have as sophisticated technology as today. Whether it's even doing an EKG, monitors, ambulatory monitors, pacemakers, loop recorders, all of these help us. And hence is why I think we have found that atrial fibrillation incidence or prevalence has increased in the last several years. It's more a combination of better methods of diagnosis and also all of us living longer. Atrial fibrillation or arrhythmia, abnormal rhythm of the heart, two most common reasons are aging. We're privileged to get older, so if you're gonna get older, we're invariably gonna probably develop atrial fibrillation, if not all, a majority of us. And if you are older, there are higher incidence and prevalence of developing high blood pressure. So age and high blood pressure are the most common causes of atrial fibrillation. And you also have this special interest in women. Absolutely. Um, we'll, I'd like to focus the, on the women a little later. I'll finish about uh, atrial fibrillation. So the other causes, like Dr. Panabianco said, prevention, prevention, prevention. Really treating diseases in the early stages, and I would really try to emphasize and highlight prevention. If we prevent the diseases from happening, you can prevent non-modifiable risk factors of age and family history. And it, sex. Yes, gender. Um, so you can't modify these three things, but there's a lot of things that other things we can modify. And the other risk factors for atrial fibrillation are number one, being coronary heart disease of the modifiable heart uh, risk factors. Coronary heart disease, congestive heart failure, diabetes, obesity, sleep apnea, and all the other things, chronic obstructive lung diseases, um, uh, metabolic syndrome. But modifying these risk factors help prevent or at least not worsen atrial fibrillation. Because atrial fibrillation, the natural history goes from paroxysmal, where it comes and goes on its own, then persistent, where it comes, the heart doesn't go from the dance to a regular pump unless you shock it or give it a very strong group of medications called antiarrhythmics, and then it becomes permanent. Of course, obviously, it's much more harder to treat when it gets to the permanent stages. So you want to try to identify it early, try to prevent it by doing all the changes, lifestyle modifications, adapt behavioral modifications and better lifestyle and preventing it. Coming to women's heart disease, of course, being a woman, it's my passion, and uh, I believe that we as women have to take um, ad advocacy into our hands and spread the awareness. What's very important to understand as women out there is that breast cancer is a very important issue, but heart disease is a much more important issue. One in three women die of heart disease. One in 25 women die of breast cancer. About 9,000 women are affected with coronary heart disease or have their heart attack, whether it's ST elevation or non-ST elevation MI, annually in, Amer in the United States. And about 6.6 .6 million are afflicted in total with coronary heart disease. And that's what needs to be recognized. Heart disease is the number one killer for women. And if you combine all causes of death, 
breast cancer, lung cancer, chronic obstructive um, pulmonary disease, stroke, all of them combined together fall short of the number of deaths of cardiovascular disease. Thankfully though, in 2005, the number of deaths from cardiovascular diseases in women was about 460,000. It's now in the latest uh, CERC article in American Heart in 2015, it's come down to 398,000. We've made a huge progress due to multiple different reasons, technology, pharmaceutical industry, physicians, awareness, initiatives taken by American Heart. Despite of all of this, I think what's very important to understand is that since 1984, since I think we started keeping better statistics, more women than men have died every year from cardiovascular diseases. Okay, well, it's th food for thoughts. Absolutely, I can go on for hours, but women just need to recognize that it's really important. You, and hypertension is the number one silent killer. You don't have any symptoms, but silently it kills almost every organ in your body, slowly but surely. So even if you may not feel well, I encourage all of you out there to go out, see your doctor. If not at 20, definitely by 30. You need to have your cholesterol checked every year, blood pressure checked every year. You need to have your blood work done. You don't need to have the symptoms. Don't need to end up with lactactic panabianco said and stages of disease. Try and go prevention. Try and run out there. Women in heart disease, 25 to 30 minutes of aerobic exercise. Not necessarily every day, just three times, three times a week reduces your risk by almost sixfold. Thank you very much. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes today's episode of Robert Wood Johnson University's Health Talk. Please remember that the opinions expressed here by our medical experts are not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. If you need a physician, please call our physician referral line at 1-888-MD-RWJUH. For more information about Robert Wood Johnson Hospital's cardiology services, please visit our website at www.rwjuh.edu. Thank you for watching.